The following is a podcast about giftedness and other brain stuff. You can support it by sharing it with everyone you know who has a brain. Thank you. Welcome to the mind. What do we really mean by genius? Matters. Giftedness is so much more than an academic label. Podcast. We tend to think of gifted as kids being good at everything across the board. An exploration of giftedness. Originals are nonconformists. Creativity. People who not only have new ideas. Intelligence. They're the people you want to bet on in childhood. They like to learn about things, but I like to learn my way. And beyond. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. Hey, it's Emily Kircher Morris, and today I'm excited to talk with Deb Douglas. She's an author and an advocate for gifted kids, and our subject today will be self-advocacy. So hang around, we've got a lot to go over. Uh, But first, a shout out to our new listeners and everyone who heard about us for the first time in Atlanta at the American Counseling Association's annual conference last week. I was excited and honored to give a presentation about perfectionism. We had a huge turnout for that presentation, which always makes it go well, and I made a lot of new friends during that event. So if you're one of those new listeners to us, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you stick around. Um, You know, one of our goals is to be accessible to our listeners and to take your thoughts and ideas into consideration when we're deciding on subjects and guests for Mind Matters. So if you have an idea or a thought or just a comment, there's a contact us form on our website, which is mindmatterspodcast.com. But of course, you can always tweet us at mindmatterspod or reach out to us on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash mindmatterspodcast. We're really excited to hear about your thoughts on the show, um, any suggestions you might have, topics you'd like for us to cover. So be sure to follow us so that you can participate in that conversation. Deb Douglas is ahead, and we'll also hear from our panel of experts. So don't go away. The Mind Matters podcast recognizes organizations who help gifted children thrive. One of these organizations is the National Association for Gifted Children. NAGC supports those who enhance the growth and development of gifted and talented children through education, advocacy, community building, and research. We invite you to visit giftednessknowsnoboundaries.org and join NAGC's movement to see, understand, teach, and challenge gifted and talented children from all backgrounds. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. So we're lucky to have Deb Douglas with us today, author of The Power of Self-Advocacy for Gifted Learners, which is published by Free Spirit Publishing. She's the owner and founder of GT Carpe Diem, and she developed the GT Carpe Diem workshop in 2002 to help gifted kids with self-advocacy. We'll talk about the workshop in a bit, and we'll have information about how you can bring it to your school or how parents can get details to pass along to the school counselor or administration. Deb has a Master's of Science in Curriculum and Instruction, and she has dedicated her career to helping gifted kids and helping them learn how to self-advocate. Hey, Deb. Hi, Emily. I'm really pleased to be with you today. Self-advocacy is a hugely important subject. We talk about it pretty much every day at my practice. So how did you become interested in self-advocacy as a discrete skill? First of all, I was a high school English teacher, and then I was a gifted resource teacher, and then I was a coordinator of gifted education. And I kept feeling like we were doing education to kids rather than with them. And um, I got fairly tired of waiting for the system to change and thought that the best way to do it was to see if I could change the system myself, and I needed help. And um, I thought the kids were the best people to help me change the system to meet their needs. You know, the um, for a long time, since the Marlin Report, federal and state definitions of <clears throat> giftedness have included a line, um, something about kids needing something um, beyond what was in the normal school program or the normal typical classroom. And I knew that by experience with the kids that they needed something different, but that just seemed so overwhelming. Who needed it and when do they need it? What subjects with which teachers? How should we do it? And the I knew that the only people who understood what was happening day in and day out were the kids themselves. They, they knew what was going on in their heads and in their hearts as they were sitting in classes and doing their homework and walking the halls and interacting with teachers and their peers. And yet we weren't asking them what it was they need it was kind of top-down. We were telling them as gifted kids what they needed. 
And sometimes that worked really well, and sometimes it didn't work at all. And so I just felt that um, I needed to ask them. Now, my first experiences in asking kids what they needed really just got blank stares and shrugs because the kids didn't know what they needed necessarily. They didn't know how to articulate it. Um, they didn't know they had a right to something different. I think most of them saw school as kind of a, a checklist and here's what you do as a student and you march towards graduation. We're all kind of lockstep. Um, they didn't know what the options might be. They hadn't, they hadn't taken time to reflect on themselves as learners to know what was working and what was not working because of who they were. And also they didn't know who to turn to, if, even if they wanted to ask for help. And frequently, they, if they asked for help in inappropriate ways, they ran into a wall. So all of this suddenly came together one day. I, I frequently tell a story about a, a student called Ryan. It's actually an amalgamation of a lot of gif different kids' stories. But um, I simply said to him, you're struggling in school. Your teachers are worried. You're a gifted kid. What do you need? And he didn't have a clue. And so we sat down and tried to figure out what the issues were that he was dealing with and how we could address those issues, how we could do some problem solving, how I could provide him some information and also provide him with feedback and how we could get him on a track where he could really develop the wonderful skills and talents and gifts that he had. And, um, and like a light bulb went off. And I thought, not just Ryan, but every gifted kid I work with needs to know how to speak up for themselves and take charge of their own education. And um, that was about 20, 20 years ago, and it's been my passion ever since. You know, so often when you ask someone, a student or um, a kid, what they need, they just look at you and shrug. But when you work backwards like that, they can figure it out. Um, they don't often even realize that they can ask for those things. So I'm curious, in your experience, how do the self-advocacy needs of gifted and high ability kids differ from those of their neurotypical peers? Well, first of all, let me be very clear that I think every person is, and every student that we as educators come in contact with and all of our students that we parents come in contact with um, need to learn to self-advocate. It's a fantastic skill that will carry us throughout our lives, whether it's in school or college or the workplace or within our families and friend relationships. So it's important. But in the educational setting, especially K-12, gifted kids have a greater need than the average. They're outliers. Just picture the bell curve. Of necessity, almost everything we do in a traditional classroom aims at that big lump of kids in the middle who are at and above around grade level. And as kids' um, abilities and strengths and needs become greater or for greater challenge or for greater support as they go up the ends of the bell curve, they are outliers and they have greater needs to self-advocate because we are not aiming at them for the most part. Now, if we talk about the struggling kids, we have a lot of things in place for struggling kids to self-advocate. And in fact, many um, of the twice exceptional kids that I've worked with have self-advocacy written as part of their IEPs. And we don't always think in terms of, yes, as outsiders, they, as much as struggling kids, need to learn how to assess themselves and ask for what it is that they need, speak up for themselves. But if you think about gifted kids who are at risk or from um, kids who live in poverty or kids who are, as I said, are twice exceptional, they might be outliers times two or three or four, depending upon where they are and the type of support they're getting. And the greater you are as an outlier, the more we need to find a way to take charge, to adapt what's already in place for ourselves as opposed to adapt to what's in place and limit ourselves. And so you're describing one of the struggles people who are um, in gifted education and, and are really passionate about it face all of the time. And that's the kind of the glossing over of high ability kids. And it comes down to them having to approach someone finally and ask for help, for somebody to recognize their needs. Well, I think we've done a bit of a disservice to even the gifted kids who we see as successful. I often think about a student, Jay, who in his senior year um, said to me, I only have one half credit in PE left to fulfill all my graduation requirements. So I'm going to do that first semester and I'm taking second semester off because I need a break. And I thought, well, you're going to give up basically one eighth of your high school education because you think you need a break. And I realized he was looking at the route to graduation as a checklist. 
and I've done all the courses I need to get. I've been accepted to the college I wanted to get into, and um, and that's it. I don't have to do anything else. And he was successful. He had a 4.0, I think, or close to it, and he had taken some of the honors courses. He'd done all of the things that he were required, but he hadn't been passionate about any of it. And what I tried to help him understand is to think in terms of, so what what do you really want to do? Not just what does the system say you have to do. Would you like a mentorship, some sort of an internship around here? Do you want to build a course of your own? Do you want to take a college course? Do you want, what are you passionate about? How can we turn you from a successful, extrinsically motivated kid into an autonomous, intrinsically motivated kid who's really going to dive into some, find what you're passionate about. Too often, those are the kids that we, we as educators and sometimes as parents say, they're wonderful. They get good grades. They've stayed out of trouble. They're going off on college. They're just where they need to be. And yet they too um, haven't really learned to love learning for learning. Say a little bit more about the simple question of why gifted kids need to self-advocate. Are there statistics about that specific need? Um, over the course of the last three or four years, I've collected pre and post workshop surveys from the kids that I've done self advocacy workshops with. They've generally been kids between fifth and twelfth grade, and um, kind of even number of boys and girls. And of those kids who came to this workshop because they were identified as gifted kids, eighty seven percent of them said they always or almost always wished they could change what was happening for them in education. But 92% of those kids said they never or almost never ask for anything. And what it turns out through conversations with them is they, like I said before, they don't know what to ask for. They don't know they have a right to it. They don't know it's really their responsibility to, to be part of this. And, and they haven't thought through who they are themselves as learners enough to know what that something is that they want. They just want something different. They haven't had it modeled for them. And that mm -hmm. comes back on us as educators to be sure they know what the process is, even from a very young age. There's a wonderful article, short article, in the most recent Teaching for High Potential, which is published by NAGC. I believe it's Tamara Fisher. It's a short article about talking to a second grade student who's been identified for gifted ed and helping them to understand what their needs might be and how they should be. She doesn't call it self-advocating, but basically that's it. Let us know when it's too easy. Let us know when it's too tough. Let us know when it's just right. And helping that second grader understand why they might need something different. We aren't very clear about that. In fact, many of our gifted education programs, we're kind of undercover. We don't want to say too much about how we identify or how we program out of fear that we're not doing enough or somebody's going to ask for, for something we can't do or that it's just going to become a um, program for kids whose parents know how to use the system as opposed to kids who really need the system. And there are so many reasons that we aren't more articulate about kids early on with their needs. And that's why throughout our lives, we need to be saying, is this right for me? And we need to empower the kids to reflect on that. So someone who's listening right now is at a place and they recognize there's a need for these skills and they need to implement a program to teach them. What are the benefits going to be? Well, there are benefits to the students themselves, of course. Um, when they ask for and receive what they need, they generally it's, they're asking for a more appropriate challenge in one subject area or in many subject areas. And with that more appropriate challenge, I see less frustration in the kids on the daily basis. I see increased motivation because they're doing something that's um, challenging, but appropriately challenging. And they are not doing more work. They're just doing different work. I find that they have greater independence and self-direction when they've learned how to self-advocate and feel like they have some control, a higher um, perception of self-efficacy that I can do this. I, not just I can do the work, but I can make a difference in my life and I can eliminate some of my own struggles. And for gifted underachieving kids, I found they really have improved academic performance when they are doing the things that they are choosing to do with our guidance, of course. But um, when they are making some of the decisions on their own, rather than feel that the system is just forcing them into a role that doesn't feel comfortable. On the flip side, tell me some of the obstacles that sort of hinder or stand in the way of gifted students. Well, first of all, they believe many of the myths that misinformed adults believe. Um, they believe that only struggling students have the right to get extra help or something different. They believe that bright students like they are should be able to get by without any special programming and that um, if you don't get good grades, you're not gifted, so you, you better not ask for anything different. 
um, and they believe that the gifted kids are always successful at whatever they do. And so um, self-advocacy means taking and making some risks that are that are really challenging. And, and many gifted kids, especially if they're ex- extrinsically motivated, had a real fear of failure, of disappointing the people around them, not getting the grades that people expect them to get or that they expect of themselves. And some gifted kids who are perfectionistic fear taking challenging, more appropriately challenging work because it might just mean more work for them if they're perfectionistic and they can't do it to their level of satisfaction. You know, we know that a lot of intellectually, academically gifted kids and maybe introverted, probably a greater percentage of gifted kids than in the general population. And that introversion frequently keeps kids from speaking up for themselves unless they feel they have um, the right to do it and the guidance to do it. And basically, I think they don't, our, our kids don't self-advocate because they don't have enough information. Um, many of them don't understand giftedness at all. In fact, of those kids that I survey, one third of them have told me that no one ever talks to them about what it means to be gifted. So if they don't understand that concept and they don't understand how it relates to them and their unique self, that also keeps them from feeling they have the right to do something different. They are, it feeds into those myths and misconceptions. It's a little daunting to think about all of those hurdles between gifted kids and the help that they need. They have to have the people around them who, who will encourage and empower them. So we've talked about how educators can help, but let's talk about parents too. What can they do? So really the three point steps for parents are to ask and then to listen and then to act along with our children. Number one is simply to ask, what what would you like? Is there something we can change? How can I work with you to change it? And even on a daily basis, just the kind of how did today go? Hearing those words that kids say boring, well, what does boring really mean? Does it mean I don't like this? Or does it really mean I'm having to do 50 math problems when I understand the concept after the first three? Um, and, And as we begin to parse with our children, what they're feeling about school on a daily basis, asking them about that, and then listening to what they're saying. And sometimes for parents, that's really tough because I know I, I as a parent, I kind of rush to explain things to my kids. Well, this is the way the system works, and this is why this is going this way. Or sometimes denying their feelings. Um, no, you're not really bored, you know, or minimizing their concerns maybe, and then help them act. What's one thing we could change for this week or tomorrow or next week or next semester or next year? What's that one thing that we could work on right now? And then as we guide them through the normal problem-solving process, we can provide them with information every step of the way, and then we can provide them with feedback every step of the way as we're helping them, okay, what do you want to change? What's that goal? What are the steps we're going to have to do to get there? How are we going to get those steps done? Who's responsible for them? And how how can we work together to get this to the end? And then if we get to the end of what their goal is, what they want to do, and it's not necessarily successful, to be able to provide feedback and reflect on that and just say, okay, that didn't quite work. Do we want to go back and try it a different way? Or do we just want to leave that one alone and, and have another goal? I found with the students in my workshops, they generally, their goals fall into four categories. Either they want a more appropriate challenge at school, either a faster pace or more depth or something. Um, Secondly, they frequently want to explore an interest that's not typically covered within their school. One of my favorite was um, a student wanted to find more kids who would like to learn Tolkien Elfish with him. (laughs) And actually in that workshop, three kids raised their hands and said, I do. (laughs) And then, um, and that's the other thing, a, a goal for many gifted kids is simply to spend more time with other kids like them. And um, unless they're in a gifted school or in a uh, gifted classroom or a cluster group, they frequently don't spend a lot of time working and learning together with kids like them. One of, one of the kids I know set up a, um, a quiz bowl at school and they practiced at noon just because he wanted to get together with other kids who had kind of a competitive spirit but knew a lot of stuff and and it wasn't just gifted kids who joined that but it was it was indeed the kids who had knew a lot of stuff and had um, a competitive edge and um, and they loved they loved being together 
Um, and the fourth thing that, um, fourth goal is many kids need to change something in their home or school environment that's going to be an accommodation for a personal trait they have. Maybe it deals with their perfectionism or some of the issues that arise out of overexcitabilities or um, one student just needed to create a quiet study space in his own home because there were a lot of people in his family and he didn't have a place where he could shut out the commotion of family life. And um, so as we help our children as parents and as educators figure out what their goal is going to be, um, how do we help them go in that direction? How do we help them set the goal and then create this plan and then encourage them along the plan, even as difficult as it might be, to either fruition or to revising the plan and starting all over again? That act of listening to what their kids are telling them could help empower parents to talk about these things more with their kids. I mean, it's a tendency to sit back and not get as involved because of the stereotype of not wanting to be that parent. And I think all of us who have gifted children feel at one time or another like we are that parent. And yet I have been that parent and I've also been that educator. <laughs> and I know, I know that we can work together with the student taking the lead. And if if both of us are focusing on this student and the student is saying, this is what I need, more often than not, that goal, that plan comes to fruition. I very seldom ever found something that a student was asking for, knowledgeably and rationally, denied. I might have been scoffed at a little bit, or as an educator, I might have been scoffed at a little bit. So you mentioned the GT Carpe Diem workshop. Can you tell us a little more about it and how that concept came about? Absolutely. I needed a way when I was a gifted coordinator in district to assure that all of my students moving into middle school had this basic information, these insights, and some of the strategies that they would need. So it's a one-day workshop. We work through those four steps. The students, um, actually, we begin with students venting their frustrations, their great gripes about giftedness, because they have a lot. And unless we listen to them and, and allow them to voice them, they don't move past them. But then, after we've talked about these gripes and validated their gripes, we shred them and we say, now we're going to figure out how to get rid of those gripes. And we work through the four steps of self-advocacy. They spend some time talking about their rights and their responsibilities as gifted learners and what it means and doesn't mean to be gifted. Then we also um, look at their learner profiles and help them to reflect on themselves as learners, their strengths, their interests. We look at the five areas that Karen Rogers brought up, which includes cognitive functioning and academic strengths and interests and preferences in learning and also personal traits. And then we talk about what options are or might be available and how do you match those options to your own learner profile. And then choose an option, make a plan for how you're going to do that, and then learn how to connect with the advocates who can make it happen. We use a um, an improv of Jim Delisle and Judy Galbraith's uh, 10 tips for talking to teachers and the kids improv appropriate and inappropriate ways to ask for to <laughs> self-advocate, which is always a really fun afternoon. And, um, and at the end of the day, the students leave with their plan. Key to the success of this is that it's not just the students who attend, but for every school or district or classroom, um, a parent, um, a school counselor or a teacher also attends so that students have an advocate who goes back to the classroom back to the school with them, with the knowledge, the insights, the information and strategies that the kids have now and can help follow through on their plans to make sure they're happening. Right. Now, some of the plans are very small. Um, we try to make sure that every kid live, leaves with a plan. But at the end of the workshop, there may not be a big plan for every child, but they leave with the knowledge and information about self-advocacy so that somewhere down the road when they do need to self-advocate, they can flash back to this and say, this is the time. This is what I need right now. And people can find out more about the workshop in your book, The Power of Self-Advocacy for Gifted Learners. That book has some tools that educators and parents can use right away, correct? That's correct. In fact, I wrote the book because so many of the advocates who attended, adult advocates who attended the workshop said, oh, I, I wish I could do this back in my district. And I said, you can. And I decided to publish the facilitator guide and all the materials that I use so that, um, so that people can create their own workshops um, or whatever form of direct instruction they'd like to do in their own districts. Um, and parent can certainly take it to the district and say, let's do this, or a group of parents can get together and do it. Um, schools, 
um, cooperative educational services, anybody. Um, and, and the first part of the book is kind of the who, why, and when of self-advocacy and the digital material is the how to do it. So at the risk of sounding like an infomercial, I've had the opportunity to read your book and it helped me feel empowered. And I'm really looking forward to using some of those tools in, in my own practice to help clients learn to self-advocate. How kind of you to say that. that. That is my hope is that all of us who know and love gifted kids have self-advocacy as part of our toolkit. And when kids are ready to do it, we know what they need and can, can help them get there. So Deb, before we go, how do you want people to find you? I have a website, uh, and most of my contact information uses GT, Gifted and Talented, Carpe Diem, since that's the name of my workshop. Um, so my website is gtcarpediem.com, and I have a Facebook page, GT Carpe Diem. Um, I'm also on Twitter, uh, look for Deb Douglas 52 and I'm just learning to tweet, but um, I'm, I'm there a little bit. Um, Instagram, and um, if you want to connect with me through my um, web page, my website, there's a, um, a contact page, and you can and fill in the details there, and I get back to you as quickly as I can. So, Deb, thank you so much for, um, for your time today and your passion about this subject. I know that there are a lot of educators and families who are listening who are really going to benefit from this information. I really appreciate your interest in this topic. You can tell I'm passionate about it, and, and I'm here to gather together all of those of us who are. Deb Douglas, the author of The Power of Self-Advocacy for Gifted Learners, available from Free Spirit Publishing or wherever you buy your books, and owner of GT Carpe Diem, thanks so much for your time and talking with me. Thanks, Emily. Now, let's hear from our panel of experts. Standing up for yourself in tough situations. I would say knowing what your needs are and making sure that they're met. You know, it would be really great if people could recognize this step in you and help you through it ahead of time. But there's a point where you have to, you know, realize that people are focused on their own problems sometimes. I pushed for some of the things on my 504 at school. I did think that I was coming off kind of aggressive, but I knew that it was something important to me that I needed. So I really pushed for that. You're not always going to get the help you need if you don't know how to look for it, um, how to explain what you're going through. Don't let other people control how you see yourself. They're gonna try and tell you you don't need that or do this instead. And you should probably just stick to what you know best about yourself. Sometimes you just need to talk to someone who has a better understanding of it. To reach the Mind Matters Podcast, go to our website, mindmatterspodcast.com, and click on Contact. Follow us on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod, on Facebook at Mind Matters Podcast, or you can reach our YouTube channel through our website. Teaching kids about self-advocacy is a huge hand up. Self-advocacy is a tool that's useful throughout life, not only in the academic setting, but in relationships with family and friends or even the work environment as kids get older. Too often in our schools, bright kids are told to sit down and wait. You'll be just fine. And they internalize the feelings that come along with that, that their need to be engaged in learning at an appropriate level just aren't top priorities in the educational setting. When we help high ability students understand their gifts and interpret their needs, we set them up to reach levels of achievement we may not have realized they were capable of reaching. When we coach them to understand what it means to be gifted, and let's not pretend they don't already know that they're different, when we do that, we give them the tools to verbalize what they need and how it will help them. You know, special educators are talking to their kids about self-advocacy too, and we can take a page from their book when we think about our twice exceptional students. Special education kids, gifted kids, 2 e kids, they all have academic and emotional needs that are outside the norm. They're different from their neurotypical peers. They need tools to make sure that those needs don't go unnoticed. And appropriate self-advocacy is the first strategy in that toolbox that'll make sure that those needs don't go unmet. We, parents and teachers, we can't be with students day in and day out. We can't be in contact with their teachers to tell them they already know this topic or a different teaching style would be better. 
We need gifted kids to learn from a young age that they have a voice in changing their education and their world. When we empower kids to make their voices heard, we enable them to go further than we could have ever imagined. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. Do something nice for yourself today. See you next time on Mind Matters. I try to figure out who I am. Not sure what I'm doing here. And the days don't work out the way I thought they would. And before you, there was no one who understood. Never found somewhere I fit in. Until I met you, I was feeling lost. But you're the one who can make it go away. All you have to do is look at me. Sometimes I, I can't breathe But it feels like you're the one who saves me When I try, but don't succeed Yeah, it feels like you're the one who saves me The one who saves me Thanks for listening to the Mind Matters Podcast with Emily Kircher Morris. To learn more about us and our mission, go to mindmatterspodcast.com. If you'd like to show your support for Mind Matters, find us in Apple iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe and leave us a positive review. Start a discussion and follow us on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod or on Facebook at facebook.com slash mindmatterspodcast. Help spread the word about the Mind Matters Podcast. Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services.